Law and Economics, Chapter 3, A Brief Introduction to Law and Legal Institutions, Section 3, The Nature of a Legal Dispute. A legal dispute arises when someone claims to have been illegally harmed at the hands of another. It is possible that the victim and the injurer can resolve uh, their dispute to themselves, but sometimes they cannot. The person who feels injured may have a cause of action, that is, a valid legal claim against another person or organization to assert uh, to assert that action he files a complaint and is therefore referred to as the plaintiff. The uh, complaint must state what has happened, why the plaintiff feels he has been injured, what area of law is involved, what statute or other law is relevant, and what relief he wishes the court to give him. The complaint and the management of the subsequent aspects of the dispute are complicated matters. Typically, private citizens retain the services of a lawyer who usually has far more experience in these matters uh, than does the citizen to help them in all this. Superscript 11, which reads, Private citizens may, of course, represent themselves in a legal dispute that is referred to as someone appearing pro se, that is, for himself. A common joke among lawyers is that a person who represents himself uh, has a full for a client. The person who is alleged to have injured the victim or plaintiff is called the defendant and must answer, uh, answer the complaint. The answer does not go into detail about the matter at hand. Rather, it is a short statement of what the defendant intends to argue in detail if the matter goes to trial. Thus, the answer may say that the facts as alleged are true, but that even so, the defendant is not legally responsible for the plaintiff's misfortune. Figuratively, this form of answer says, So what? Uh, or the answer may say that the facts as alleged in the complaint are incorrect and that when the true facts are known, the defendant will be seen to be innocent of any wrongdoing. The dispute uh, may well stop at this point. For example, the parties may decide not to proceed to trial. They may drop the whole matter or they may settle their dispute, uh, that is, reach a mutually satisfactory agreement between themselves. If the case is not settled or dropped, a judge must make a determination based on the complaint and the answer whether there is sufficient reason to proceed to trial. The judge may determine that the plaintiff has failed to state a valid cause of action or that the defendant has made a complete and convincing answer to the complaint. If so, she might dismiss the complaint or enter summary judgment for the defendant. Uh, usually, she will allow the parties to proceed to trial. Parties may appeal from a summary judgment or a dismissal. If the dispute proceeds to trial, a jury may be impaneled to determine the facts or else the case will be tried to a judge without a jury. This latter situation is called a bench trial. Each side will develop evidence and testimony supporting its assertions and then the jury or judge will retire to determine who wins. Superscript 12, which reads, Even after the trial has begun, but before the judge or jury returns with a verdict, the parties are free to settle the case. There are even examples about which we have a question in chapter 11 regarding situations in which the plaintiff has secretly settled with one of multiple defendants but allows the trial to go forward to a conclusion. The standard that the jury or judge 
will use to make this determination is by a preponderance of the evidence. Uh, that means that if the plaintiff's uh, arguments are more believable than the defendant's, then the plaintiff wins. If the defendants are more believable, the defendant wins. Uh, some people say that the preponderance of the evidence standard means that if the plaintiff's story is 51% believable, she wins. Notice that this standard, which is the routine standard in cases involving private parties as litigants, is different from the one that is used in criminal proceedings. Uh, there, the... Uh, prosecution must convince the jury that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. A more exacting standard than is preponderance of the evidence. Uh, the courts uh, can and have established other standards for prevailing in private law disputes. For example, some jurisdictions have created a standard of clear and convincing evidence or some of the aspects of a civil case, such as the award of punitive damages. No one can be certain exactly what that standard entails, but it is certainly more demanding than the preponderance of the evidence standard and less demanding than the beyond a reasonable doubt standard of criminal law. The jury returns with a verdict, which says simply which party wins, but the verdict is not the end of the matter. The judge must enter judgment on the ver verdict. It is the judgment, not the verdict, that is the controlling action of the court. But most of the time, the judge issues a judgment that follows exactly the jury verdict. But in a few rare cases, the judge decides that the jury got the matter entirely wrong and enters a judgment non obstante vertico or JNOV, judgment notwithstanding the verdict, holding the exact opposite of what the jury decided. In a civil dispute, either party, winner or loser, may appeal uh, the court's decision. The winner may appeal because he feels he has not received everything to which he is entitled. The loser may appeal for the obvious reasons that he thinks he ought to have won. Interestingly, the ground for appeal must be that the court below made a mistake about the relevant law, including the relevant general principles that the court applied and the procedures that were used in court, but not about the facts. Uh, for instance, the appellant the uh, party filing the appeal may allege that the judge gave the jury improper instructions about what the relevant law was or about what facts they could and could not consider or that the judge improperly excluded some evidence or testimony from the jury's consideration. At the appellate level, there will be no new evidence or facts introduced the appellate court takes the facts as developed and the trial court is given. The only people to appear before the appellate panel would be the attorneys for the appellant and the appellee. Appellee. The uh, attorneys will submit uh, written briefs to the appellate panel and then appear before the panel for oral argument during which they may receive very close questioning on the matters at hand. Uh, there may be additional briefs submitted by parties who are called amici, curé, friends of the court. And these uh, parties are not directed involved in the legal dispute, but feel that the legal issue involved touches their interests sufficiently that they would like the court to consider their arguments in addition to those of the appellant and the appellee. The appellate panel retires to consider the matter and later issues its opinion. The judges may be in unanimous agreement and issue only one opinion. 
However, there may be a split in the panel, and that split may result in multiple opinions, a majority and a minority, or dissenting opinions. The appellate panel may affirm the lower court's judgment or reverse the, that judgment. In some instances, the panel re uh, remands the matter, that is, sends it back to the lower court for specific corrective action, such as a recalculation of the damages owed to the plaintiff.